Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Steve Simonson, and Stephen Pope. Today, I'm excited to be speaking with Simone Hammer, the VP of product at the Vimbly Group. And we will be talking a lot about sales optimization and mastering the basics of e-commerce that allow you to scale. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help take seven-figure companies to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Simone, I started Hadley Designs back in 2015, and I grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years but I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path to getting to eight figures take a little bit longer. There were times where I doubted whether our business could survive, whether it be, could become a real brand, or whether I myself could actually be the CEO of a successful e-commerce brand. I wish I would have had a guide to help me grow faster and avoid a lot of those stumbling blocks. If you've hit a similar plateau and want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com, that's ecom with two M's, to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com with the subject line strategy audit for your chance to win. Tell me why you think your business should be the one that's selected. And don't worry if you're not selected this month because you will be entered for future months to come. But today I'm excited to introduce you to Simone Hammer. Simone is the VP of product at the Vimbly Group, a New York City-based firm that scales and invests in tech-enabled businesses where he has worked for over 10 years. He currently runs Vimbly Group's e-commerce business unit, as well as having his hands involved in a number of Vimbly Group's eight other business units. Prior to the Vimbly Group, Simone was a healthcare investment banker at a boutique investment bank in New York City, where he focused on raising capital and mid-market mergers and acquisitions involving biotech, healthcare technology, and healthcare service companies. He has a bachelor's degree from Cornell University, and I met Simone at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit earlier this year. And Simone, I'm excited to welcome you to the podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Josh. Really, uh, really appreciate that nice intro. Thanks for having me. Well, likewise, we had a great conversation at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit. And one of the th the first things that we talked about when when I met you is you're like, yeah, I kind of have like eight different businesses that I'm involved in right now. And I was like, wait, hold on, back up. Like, let's let's dive into this further. And so from the moment we had that first conversation, I was like, this is a guy who's doing some awesome stuff that I need to not only follow you, but would love to have you on the podcast. And so, uh, Simone, You've got a lot of experience with mergers and acquisitions. You've been at the Vimbley Group for a while. You know, why don't you walk us through that journey and kind of how you got into the world of e-commerce? Because prior to that, you were an investment banker, right? So that's definitely a different realm that uh, I would say your typical e-commerce business owner doesn't necessarily start in investment banking, but would love to hear kind of how that transition happened and what the Vimbley Group is all about. Yeah, so um, it, it's I guess you know from the healthcare investment banking side, uh, admittedly, it was first job out of school, and at Cornell, you just happened to have at least the network that I was a part of, just happened to have a lot of people going into finance at the time. <clears throat> so, um, admittedly, followed the herd, went into finance. Uh, I was pre med at school. Uh, Realized I didn't want to do that uh, at some point towards the end of my college career, and and so it was kind of this nice little kind of merger of some things that I was doing with healthcare, and then again following the herd. Um, but uh, I enjoyed my time, learned a ton, learned a ton about 
that has shaped basically the way I think about business now. Sure. And uh, at the end, I got linked up with Sam and Chris, who are two guys who were tossing around this idea of starting this um, marketplace for people to find and book recreational activities called Vimbley.com. So there's no website. Um, you know, just kind of like a, an idea. And linked up with them, we built out what was Vimbley.com uh, and still is Vimbley.com. Uh, it's a marketplace for people to find and book things like... Um, wine and cheese tasting, skydiving, cooking classes, dance lessons. Um, and then uh, after about a couple of years, uh, we started being able to license out the technology that we built. Long story short, we did that, had a few su successful exits, parlayed some of that into investing in businesses and acquiring businesses and then home growing our own. At some point, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, <clears throat> um, maybe seven years ago, we started doing a deeper dive into this whole e-commerce space or what most of the people think about e-commerce, um, where it's, you know, Amazon, Shopify, things of that nature. And um, felt like it was a good opportunity to support some of the growth that we were having with our other traditional, you know, software businesses. Um, and everything is kind of a, a tech focused um that's kind of our um uh kind of sweet spot where we can parlay our experience with different technologies and expertise on different uh you know SaaS products to different industries and we thought that e-commerce was a growing space we thought we had this unique ability where we had operational expertise from running some other businesses to um you know really start to kind of do like a roll-up strategy kind of akin to what aggregators do now but a little bit before they really became popular. Um, and uh, the mission was never to kind of like buy, grow, and sell, kind of traditional like private equity, but to uh, really buy and hold and grow and use it to fund some other businesses. And, and kind of what we've done in other business units is where we've built stuff, you know, see if uh, that come from needs, um, see if there's maybe something that we can build and grow from the software side out of our own needs being operators of an e-commerce business. And so, you know, fast forward to today, um, we've acquired a few brands and we're constantly looking at others um, and uh, trying to launch some new products as well. So that's I where we are it. today. I know that you, we could probably d dive into a lot of weeds there in, in that story. The yeah, and, that, and that's just one business unit too. I mean, we 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 have a few <laughs> others, but uh, I think you know this being the ecom podcast, we'll keep it focused on that. Yeah, no, this is great, and that's what's exciting. I think you've got your hands into so many different kind of business ventures. You're seeing what's working even outside of e-commerce, and I think that's one of the important things to do. Is like, you know, I think we all want to like specialize in e-commerce, and we think like, hey, what's the latest and greatest like e-commerce strategies or hacks and things like that. But if you really like almost like step outside the box and you say, what's working for restaurant owners, right? How are they driving traffic? What's working for them? How are they building their audience or list? Right. And you start taking kind of the best practices from other industries. And then you can kind of get completely brand new ideas into, you know, e-commerce, for example. And so I think that's what's interesting is you've got your hands in so many different things here, Simone. Um, let's talk. Let's dive into some of those things um, in e-commerce that you are looking for. So as you look to acquire other brands, and I love that you kind of were an acquirer or aggregator before the aggregator thing became <laughs> pop became popular. So you're not on the uh, the bandwagon there. You can be like, no, we we were doing this a long yeah. a long time ago. So what what do you look for when you're looking to acquire a brand? So walk us through that kind of thought process. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> one of the very first things that we always uh that we always kind of toss around and make sure about is market size. Um, you know, I like to use the example of, you know, if you have and and what's the true market size, right? Cuz a lot of time, you know, numbers are funny. You can use any sort of number and find any sort of number to to uh, affirm, you know, confirmation bias, right? Affirm any sort of narrative that you're portraying. But what, what's the, get really smart and be honest about what's the true market size. 
And so I like to use this example of, you know, in terms of e-commerce space, if you're looking at a product and you have your main keyword and say it's 50, you know, roughly 50,000 searches and, you know, you look at your prior to opportunity explorer or, you know, use Helium 10 or data dive, whatever. And you see that, you know, the 80% of the clicks are going to the top five products. Well, <clears throat> is your true market size really 50,000, you know, searches per month? No, probably not. Right. Um, so let's, you know, just use some thumb in the air math here and say, okay, well, if 80% of the clicks are going to these top five products, well, it's reasonable to say, okay, well, you know, right off the bat, you're probably not going to enter into that market. So you really just have that remaining 10,000 searches. And then we could say, okay, well, of that, right, what's, what's realistic can we take from the remaining portion? So I don't know, conservative basis, let's say 10%. You know, you, maybe you want to, you know, toot your own horn, you have this amazing product, you can take a little bit more of that, but, you know, say 10%. So we're, we're already down to a thousand searches, right? And then, and then of that, what's your conversion rate, right? So let's be conservative, say a modest 10%. Are you looking at a hundred searches per, or a hundred sales per month, roughly? And is that sufficient size for your business, right? For the time that you're going to spend. And I think what we've seen across businesses, and I'm sure Josh, you've launched way more products than we have. Um, you know, what the time and effort that goes into your smallest product from a revenue standpoint is probably just the same or almost nearly the same as for your hero product. Um, and that's the case, not just with e-commerce, right? That's the case with, um, with every business that we, have, uh, that we own. Um, the amount of energy it takes to do small deals is just as great as doing big deals, right? And so it's what space do you want to play in? So market size is, um, is really everything, right? Um, and especially if you start talking about, you know, you have a more niche product, right? And so, yeah, you may fit under this, right? Maybe you have a, you know, an interesting doorstop, right? Um, and doorstop, you know, as again, 50,000 searches, but are you really playing in just the doorstop marketplace? Is your, if yours is super unique, maybe not. Right. And so I think getting really smart about that is, is, um, is pretty critical, um, because that sets the stage for everything else that you're going to do and, and how much energy is realistic for you to put into this and, and what you can expect, right? What's your real ROI after that? It's, it's all about competitive advantage, right? I think again, this isn't unique to e-commerce or, you know, products. This is um, the case with SaaS. It's the case with, you know, a restaurant, right? What kind of competitive advantage? What What is it going to attract people to buy from you? And um, I think we have some interesting things that we failed on in the e-commerce side. And, you know, again, when we, all the past 10 years, I think we've, we've messed that up a lot. But um, at the end of the day, you know, <clears throat> why is someone going to buy from you? What? what can you answer, can you answer that yourself? And if you don't have a strong enough answer for that, um, you know, whether we're buying, we're starting new, um, we're partnering up. Well, if you can't answer that yourself and you got all this knowledge in front of you, then that consumer of whatever it is that you're selling product service, you know, what have you, is probably not going to be able to do that in the five, 10 seconds that they're, looking at what it is that you have to offer. So I think those two things kind of kick off everything that we do. And then from there, you know, that we have some due diligence and then I think everybody has their own, you know, kind of personal style in terms of how they like yeah. to value opportunities. But I think those two are absolutely critical. And without those two and having really honest answers to those, um, you're kind of setting yourself up to fail. Interesting. I love that you talked about, you know, the market opportunity first and foremost. So I guess at this point, you guys are kind of like swinging for the fences, so to speak, right? Like you're going, you want to move into products where there's massive, you know, market opportunity. Is, is that what you're saying? Or are you trying to establish like, hey, there's room for disruption in this market and there, there is, you know, some meat on the bones, so to speak. Yeah, so the, it's it's a good question, um, and I, I'll keep this I'll keep this answer focused on e-commerce um, because there, that answer is actually slightly different depending upon the business unit because of where different businesses are. Um, but in terms of e-commerce, we're actually looking at a lot of different things. We're not just looking at the ones with the largest market because the ones with the largest market, uh, and you're trying to you know, take market share. So you have an innovative product, right? Not just a, you know, 
a, a different mousetrap, right? You yeah. actually have something new to bring to the table. Um, we're looking at some of those. Um, but at the same time, we're also looking at some, to use a baseball analogy, right? We're also looking at just some singles, right? Because a lot of singles equals a home run, right? And so yeah. um, we're kind of looking at things across the board. Uh, when we look to acquire, we're generally looking at things that have a big, bigger market potential because there's a lot more things to get a deal done over the finish line. And, and then there's kind of a lot of work to incorporate a business that you acquire. Um, rather than starting a new product within your portfolio. Yeah. Um, and as I think we're starting to see across e-commerce space, more people, you know, especially us now, are, are really starting to try to focus on um, brand building. And in those situations where you're building out a, a product line and you're actually building out a brand, having a bunch of singles is not a bad thing because there's a lot of different things that you can do um, with those smaller products. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a roundabout way of saying we, we kind of look at everything from an e-commerce perspective. Um, but going back to it being the market size, we have to know ahead of time, like, you know, if we are going after a smaller market, we have to know that in advance because we're going to say, okay, well, we know that this is a smaller market. So when we prioritize and when we do different things, we're going to allocate it only the attention that this is going to deserve because it's never going to be mm. bigger than that. Right. And so it's a, it's an ROI question at that point, you know, return on investment. And so maybe this is like the, investment banker speech coming out in me. But um, I think, you know, even in those questions where we say, okay, we'll go after the smaller market, it's still of utmost importance because then it's going to affect later on how we view that ROI and how we view how we prioritize it and how much time and energy we're going to put into it just because of the return that we could potentially get on that smaller thing. It's not that we shy away from it. We just have to know up front. Um, what that math is to make it uh, actual add up to positive value. Yeah. You know, I think that that's so important. And I think you did a really good job. You you kind of alluded to it earlier, but with our brand, you know, we have over 1300 different products. So we've had our fair share of launching lot. different products yeah. and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Right. And not everything has been like the, a huge success. Right there are a lot of singles and a lot of bunts along the way that just get us those base hits, you know, um, going back to your baseball analogy. And then we have had a handful of those home runs that do like just move the business further um, that much further. But I like, you know, especially as we're moving into a more mature phase of our business, we are now finally kind of going into those bigger product opportunities that are going to require extra capital and probably advanced strategies in terms of being able to market those products um, than we did before. So I'm curious to hear kind of your thoughts, Simone. You know, the way that we grew our brand was honestly like we probably did the opposite of what you're doing in terms of like looking at market potential. We probably started with like, all right, what's the small markets that we can play in? And we honestly flew under the radar for the first four years, right? Like you would look at our portfolio and the best products doing like maybe five to 10 sales a day at best. Right. But mm -hmm. we've got a bunch of singles that are just like, that's compounded. Like it's a more, it's a multi-million dollar business, but yeah, granted there, there are, are a lot of skews. So I'm curious, like in, in your experience, maybe there at the Vimbley group, um, unless you're VC funded and you just come with a, a bunch of cash and, you know, a bunch of connections where you can just, hire a bunch of executives to go run things. Do you almost recommend, you know, people just kind of like scaling up like piece by piece and maybe it is okay to maybe start by playing in those smaller fields. Right. But then understand that if you want to take your, your brand to the next level, right. Eight figures and beyond, then you do need to start really looking at the market size and moving into more of those, you know, let's say competitive spaces where you see, opportunities. What are your thoughts on that breakdown there? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's probably really, so I mean, the way you did it from, uh, you know, for us, again, it's, a, it's a little bit different because we were coming from a place where we were going to start by acquiring. Right. Right. And we did that because it's a lot easier to acquire a business that's already at one than to go, you know, go from one to N is a lot easier. Um, I mean, there, there's some troubles, don't get me wrong. 
Um, but going from zero to one is a lot of harder a lot of times. Yeah. And so, I mean, we see that. I mean, we launch, we launch some products and it takes a lot of work and it's, you know, launching is hard. Um, <clears throat> and so I think um, it kind of depends on a couple things. One, your risk profile. Two, uh, how much capital you have to start and what you're willing to kind of put up with. Because usually... In the bigger markets, if you're going to play, you need a little bit more capital to play because you need to do right. you need to do a little bit more marketing to get your name out there. You may need to you know run at tighter margins for a longer period of time to get your early sales. Um, and if it's a bigger market, it's probably a little bit more established. There's more players, which inherently, you know, macroeconomics speaking, there's going to be uh, thinner margins to begin with. So you. It's it requires much more kind of math, right, up front to be like, okay, well, if I'm going to start in a bigger market place, um, uh, or a bigger market size, and I'm going to go after bigger terms, there, I need to be really smart on, okay, well, wh- what is realistic in terms of my upfront capital investment to say, okay, this is how long I'm going to run at like a break even, or even I'm going to run at a little bit of a loss. Right. And I'm okay with that because yep. this is the purpose that I'm going to do that. Right. Even today, right. I mean, we, we hate doing things at a loss. Right. I mean, like it's just bad business. Right. But, yeah. But, uh, sometimes we will in the event that we say, okay, well, I see why we're going to do this for like a month or a few weeks or, you know, two months. It's stretching a little bit, but like I can see why we're going to do that because it, the potential gain after those two months is so large and we can stomach that, right? We're okay with losing X to make Y. And so everything comes back to this, right? Like again, I think, you know, comes back to the market size because you have to be sure on Y or have a reasonable percent chance that like, or outcome that you believe in that this Y can happen, right? You're going to make Y make that return by investing X or losing X. Um, and so I think, you know, again, it comes back to that market size where it, when you start smaller, right, and maybe your risk profile is a little less, like y- 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 you don't have to make some of those decisions, right? You could be a little bit more loosey-goosey with it, or you don't have to be as fine-tuned in terms of, you know, what the actual, <clears throat> like, loss is because you don't have as tight um, margins in that market potentially. So I think... Um, yeah, I think, you know, as you get as you get bigger and you really want to take the next step, I think eventually you are going to have to take on some of those bigger questions, right? You're going to have to take on those bigger market sizes. You're going to have to say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to have to invest a little bit more to actually grow that brand up front. Um, and, and again, we start talking about brands, I think, as you get bigger because yep. it's ultimately the way kind of e-commerce is moving where if you don't have that brand that people can really latch onto, you don't have that product line that you can, you know, cross sell, upsell. Um, you don't have something that really distinguishes you. And that's ultimately what is your brand is helping out with, you know, your competitive advantage and helping you distinguish what it is that you have. Well then, you know, there's a whole bunch of people or uh, sellers out there that are going to be selling something very, very similar for probably a, a reduced price just because yep. they're trying to do the same things as you are, right? And acquire market share. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think those are good. Those are good takeaways. And, and I agree with you there. I think that, you know, people just need to understand where they're at in their journey, right? And for us, we are finally at the place where, we can make, you know, we just put a PO in for $250,000. We would not have been able to do that a few years ago, right? And so it's been building up kind of those cash reserves, so to speak, so that we can go play in some of those big market opportunities. But I think that's the vision that I would hope the listeners have is that they understand this is where you can go, um, not just continuing to play in the small space that you might be currently playing in, but maybe being willing to venture it out into those bigger spaces. And that's where, you know, the returns can be greater, but you also have to get more experienced with running the numbers, being good at math and being able to track like your KPIs. Um, And then that's a whole nother level of like building out a a team of people that can help in, in building this and achieving that vision. So I think we could go on and on and on with that there, but, Simone, what I did want to dive back into is 
So you find you found a product or a company that is in a good market, right? That it's a big market opportunity that you guys see. They are differentiated. What are some of the other key things that that you look at when you get into the more details of a business that make you say like, oh yes, like let's move forward on acquiring this brand versus what are some maybe even warning flags, you know, would maybe even be better ones to say like, if you see things like this, start running for the hills, so to speak. Yeah. So I, I think um, there's kind of like a, a bunch of questions. One of the first ones is always like, do we believe in this? Like, are we excited about mm. doing this? Right. I think, um, you know, as an example, we bought a brand nature's hangout and um, you know, it, it did a lot of what we call like outdoor specialty. So there were some like bird feeders. Uh, There's some like hammocks, hammock straps. It's kind of a little bit all over the place. It wasn't a cohesive, like necessarily brand. We kind of lumped it in this thing called um, outdoor specialty. And, um, you know, we weren't as excited at the time about some of the outdoor stuff. Uh, so, um, or what I would consider traditional, like outdoor stuff. So like the hammocks, hammock straps, we were more excited about the bird feeders. Um, for a number of different reasons. And, um, you know, one of my partners, uh, he had a bunch of birds growing up, was super excited about it, right? Like, um, you know, I had a few bird feeders before we bought the business, you know, and, and he was like all gung ho about that side of it. And, and so we we're super excited about it, built it up, we we're killing it. And we we're like, okay, well, you know, maybe we have, <clears throat> um, a kind of a, a little, segue into this like animal space, if you will. And granted, this was also at the time where very early on nature's hangout was actually the um, first, you know, traditional e-com business that we bought or Am what's called Amazon business that we bought. And um, so this was more back in the day where we were just throwing up products and people could just throw up products. You didn't really need to build brands. And, uh, and that was, all well and great. Like you could build a really big business just having ad hoc products. And so we were like, okay, well, even so, like we could actually have this nice little portfolio of products um, uh, that we could maybe turn into a brand or, or really build out nature's kind of rebrand nature's hangout into this animal specific mm. company. Right. And we looked at bat feeders, squirrel feeders, a whole bunch of different things. We're doing some test buys and, um, and squirrel feeders ended up bubbling to the top for a number of different reasons. And, you know, pretty quickly, actually, we were, you know, kind of top of the page. We we're doing pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, for a number of different reasons, but one of the biggest ones is we didn't 100% believe in squirrel feeders, right? At the end of the day, yeah. it wasn't really a space that we wanted to play in. And, you know, we had our sights on all these other things, right? And this is a, also, I'm going to double back on kind of focus and priorities and keeping the main things, the main things here. Um, but I think at the end of the day, right, we, like we saw with squirrel feeders was that, look, there's like a nice market opportunity where we kind of like carved ourselves out. We're, you know, ranking really well. Um, and we didn't listen to what the customers were saying at the end of the day for a number of different reasons. One, we didn't believe in it too. It was just our fault. Like we should have like, you know, now this is like a critical piece. And in, in when we assess things, like what are the customers saying about these products? Right. And we, yeah. we just flat out, we're not doing that, which is a shame too, because you know, it's bad on us because we came from a software space where, you know, I was lead product on a number of different businesses that we built out. And my whole job was just to listen to customers. Right. And, and the way we built our product was by listening to those customers. And uh, we just didn't do that. And we took our eye off the ball. Overnight, our rating went from 4.3 to 4.2, which meant that on Amazon, the stars went from 4.5 mm. to 4. Yeah. Right. And sales tanked overnight. You know, long story short, we never recovered from it. And uh, recently, we just made this decision that we kind of write down the inventory. So we basically considered it a total, all the inventory we had, just total loss wow. on our books. Um. And so, you know, lesson learned from that pretty quickly, uh, you know, when, when we're looking at businesses, one, it's got to be something that we're, that we're excited about because you're not excited about it. Well, you know, everything goes out the window, but two, we got to, yeah. got to look at the qualitative stuff too, right? Like we can look at numbers all day, we, all day, but again, numbers paint and the, especially, you know, in the day of these brokers and, 
and you know so many people selling their businesses and and putting together pitch decks and and IMs that with all these numbers that look really good and we just come off COVID times where yeah well, some businesses just exploded right yeah. what numbers are real versus what is not and sometimes it's kind of hard to to differentiate um uh, and so that's why you got to layer in the qualitative stuff and and again we we didn't do that you know bad on us should have known better um won't make that mistake again. <laughs> What other qualitative stuff would you say that people should be considering then? So <clears throat> aside from, you know, what people are saying about the product, it, the products themselves, right? I think what people are saying about, you know, this is from a building brand perspective, but mm -hmm. what people are saying about the brand, right? Okay. Uh, do they have great, do you have great customer service? Do people like, you know, do, are people unhappy with their uh, product for X, Y, and Z reason? But then do they follow up with, Oh man, this customer service was amazing. Yeah. And that kind of brand equity counts for a lot. It's hard to value, but if you have passionate people uh, and people who are excited about what you're doing, well, then you can get them from, so do a lot of advanced kind of marketing strategies, uh, or you can imp use them for a lot of the advanced marketing strategies that you want to do. And you have a, a platform to then go and launch new products to test products out with, to, yeah. um, to do a whole bunch of different things where, you know, you have a target audience immediately at your disposal and they already like what you're doing. It's actually really hard to even get people to know what you're doing and then get them to like what you're doing. Yeah. So if you even have that, right, well, then you're a few steps ahead and then you could do a lot of different things. Um, and so I, I think, you know, really seeing what people are saying about the product with the brands and I, truly listening. Right. And then uh, I think that's really big. Um, and we do some stuff, you know, ahead of time also where we'll, uh, like before we actually get into diligence with, you know, or get under, um, LOI with a company where we'll go out, buy a few products and like literally do like some guerrilla marketing stuff where mm. we'll get some people to come in the door, see what they say. You know, we'll do a bunch of surveys. So that's a little bit, I like seeing people, right. Again, this is going back to software days. Like I like seeing people, interact physically with the product, right? Whether it's software, yeah. whether it's a physical product, like seeing their eyes, seeing where their eyes go, seeing their nonverbal cues, I think is immensely important, right? When someone yeah. says they like it, but their body language is like this, yeah, it's pretty good. But someone <laughs> says, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, you know, that's a big difference. Yeah. And I think um, all those little things are things that, you know, again, we do and we try to do in a non-scalable way before we can, you know, do it in a much more scalable way. And so I think the qualitative stuff, seeing what people say, seeing what, how people react, not just about the product, but about the brand. Um, those are kind of all key measurables that we look at and that, that I specifically, you know, again, kind of some of my background, I, I tend to focus on. And, and um, if they are great, that's a huge, it's not, it could be a, a, a deciding factor. If it's a, if it's a negative thing, it's certainly a huge yeah. kind of, you know, winch pin factor. So, um, Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's really interesting, Simone. I think you've taken this approach that's actually a little bit different than I think the typical answer is, right? Because I've listened to a bunch of other people that talk about acquiring businesses, and I'm looking at these specific numbers, and, you know, I'm trying to draw conclusions and, you know, kind of look at 2020 and what happened during COVID and say, okay, this was an artificial bump, and it's all very quantitative, right? I'm looking at the numbers. I'm making sense of this financially. I can see that I could shave off 10% of their cost of goods sold. I feel like I could reduce maybe their FBA fee if we repackage the product differently. But what I love is that you just focused on like the consumer experience and the brand in and of itself, right? And as you go through due diligence of a brand, it's not just due diligence of looking at the financial statements and seeing if you guys would be good partners or they're a good business owner. Rather, you're going through and you're like purchasing the product. You're not only looking at the product, but then you're sending it to other customers, right? Or a, a focus group, so to speak, right? right? To get real feedback and maybe even open up some customer support tickets and see what it feels like on the receiving end instead of just taking people's word for it. And uh, so I think that's an amazing like mindset shift that I just had is like, Go the extra mile. Yeah, quantitative stuff, that should be the given, right? And I think there's numerous books and 
talks about yeah. what you should be looking at that way. But what I think maybe, you know, and you have a lot more experience of this than I do. Is that something that most people overlook? Is that qualitative stuff of what's their brand? What are consumers really saying? Um, how does their customer service actually work? And, you know, what are people saying about that? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I think it's one of the most overlooked things. And and we're guilty of it, too, right? Like, uh, you all the, all the quantitative stuff that you're talking about, like looking at historicals, it's a given, right? We always do that. We've always done it. And for the longest time, that's all we did. And, um, you know, one of our brands, Crestmo, right now is going through a, a major shift in that it, for such a long time, survived on three products, basically. There's a whole, you know, m there's more SKUs, but it's basically or more ASINs, but there's there's effectively three ASINs. One of those, um, it's basically a shell of itself now. And part of the reason why is because... Uh, you know, actually, if you'll divulge me for a second, I had yeah. so uh, pre-COVID and even through the first, um, you know, couple years of COVID, and depending on where you want to, you know, start and stop it, I guess, um, or you know, where where the beginning until now is, I guess. But first couple years of it, um, it was doing incredibly well, right? It was something like anywhere between twenty-five and thirty-five percent or it accounted for 25 to 35% of our gross margin. That gross margin, I'm including everything from landed costs, uh, 3PL costs, FBA costs, um, advertising, marketing, returns, all that stuff. Wow. Um, okay. Just not just not like overhead and, and software, things like that nature, but, but gross profit, right? And um, so it was a large part of our business, um, this one product. And, um, you know, during the beginning of COVID, I got my hands on a competitor, one of our biggest direct competitors, their information memorandum, which is basically like their, uh, this deck, uh, it's like 50 pages of their business because they're trying to sell their business. Okay. And through like, you know, like, you know, my, my partner, Sam, he has just a ton of connections in the entrepreneur space, ton of connections with these brokers. And so we get a lot of deals right across nice. a lot of different industries. Um, and so we just happened to get a direct competitor's information memorandum. Right. So this gave us everything about their business. Right. We, we knew yep. the numbers. We knew um, we knew. Uh, who their suppliers were, right? What their strategy was, what their projections were, like, you know, you name it, we knew it. And uh, I mean, we were like, we could look on Helium 10 and know that we we're dominating, but then we saw the real numbers. We were, you know, we were dominant player in the market. Um, and then all of a sudden, right? Like during COVID, you start seeing freight costs go up. You start seeing, um, uh, a lot of sellers into the space. Cock the cocktail shaker space is kind of the space that we're playing in for okay. you know, one of our brands, um, and this is where the the set you know was established, um, and uh, you know was this you know let's call it roughly like thirty percent of the business. Um, it had basically uh, started having rank bleed, right? The rank started dropping, dropping. We were doing all these different things all these different tricks, hacks, things we learned at BDSS, right? Buy yep. things we, you know, things we, things we heard along the way from different e-commerce sellers, like from podcasts like this, just a whole bunch of different things. We tried everything from like traditional white hat strategies to little like towing the line, like gray hat <laughs> strategies, right? Sure. Um, you know, we were firmly in this like rebate flow game, right? For a long time. And they cracked it down. There's a few different variations of that, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> you can think of it. We were doing it to try to turn around this product and um, this competitor had stayed true to what they were doing right from the beginning. Uh, we knew that, you know, through this information memorandum that basically we're producing the same exact quality uh, shakers, us this certain grade stainless steel is the same as ours. Okay. Um, the, you know, if you strip down all the marketing speech, it's effectively the same product. And, um, however, what they did do though, was they got a couple patents on like the, the, there's a stand, they got a patent on it for the design. They did a couple other things and they got some patents, but they built out a product line and they, from the beginning, 
even though they were they were getting way less sales, they were marketing their their products for ten to twenty dollars more than ours. And and on a mm. main product compared to their main product, right? I think there's like a seventeen dollar difference at the time, right? In, in the beginning, um, that difference has actually grown, by the way, because while they were building that brand and like listening to what the customers were wanting and and understanding that hey there's this like there's this uh story that they could paint we were just focused purely on the product and trying to do all these things to capture more market share from a qualitative basis we were focused on kpis we were focused on conversion rates we were focused on which hero images were going to perform better i mean th these are great things that you should focus on sure but the things we were not doing right was the um painting a story, right? What is, what is our cohesive story for this brand adding on subsequent products that we can then drive um, like cross sales into this product or what's, what things can we do from this main hero product to do cross sales and their price, you know, now we're talking about fast forward a couple of years, right? So today their price has never wavered. Even some of their products are now more expensive, right? They've increased mm. price. Yeah. Like even more laying into their narrative of this premium quality, right? Like all this other stuff. And we try to add that on now later, right? Try to like raise price, save premium, do all these kind of little like marketing tricks and nothing's really working. Now, they still don't actually have as many reviews as us because we, there was just such a big difference, but they've dramatically closed that gap, right? Their, their star rating has stayed at five stars. I think it's like 4.8, right? Ours has stayed pretty consistently at 4.5. I think it's like 4.5 and actually like shows, you know, four shows 4.5. Um, but again, like we've actually had to come down on price a lot. And now there's this race to the bottom in this space mm. where, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we were so diversified and we had this copyware side, we had a couple other brands, um, we're playing in a couple different markets where we've actually grown a lot. We would like, it is a shell of itself, this product. And we would be really hurting if it wasn't for that. And I, I say that because th this whole, this is a story of us not listening to again going back you know the squirrel feed is another one but going back to this whole uh asset of uh and i call it an asset because it really is of, of this qualitative information that you can get from your customers right and yeah. what is it that they're saying not just about the product but about the brand what they were saying about this brand all along which we just completely weren't looking at because we were so focused on our kpis and testing and iterating again not saying those bad you should be doing those things you should be doing a lot of that but yep. the, I think the qualitative stuff is something that we've now find ourselves having to readopt, right, from an e-commerce perspective um, and really make it a big focus for us when we look at it. Because with that, you can do a lot of things. And it's become, you know, I think in terms of a trend, right, a, a an actual industry trend, it's become a much bigger thing. If you don't, if you're not building brands and you're not focused on the the qualitative side of things, then, you know, you're you're just selling product. And yeah. eventually you're, it's going to happen like what happened with us with the cocktail shaker where you have um, a business that is effectively uh, suffering and competing on price. And we're going to lose on price all day long where yeah. a direct competitor now is they're not competing on price. They're competing on brand. And so I think that's, you know, this whole aspect of adding in when you're looking at when you're looking at what product you want to sell, even if you're launching a new product, right? Like you can get samples from suppliers, right? You can see, you put, you can put the current leader and your sample in someone else's hand and be like, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? Right. Um, we do that now. Right. And I think the, the amount that you learn is a much harder to kind of like reconstruct and paint a, a specific picture like you can with numbers. And so, yep. Those yep. two things in this day and age, um, and again, I don't think this is just applicable to e-commerce, right? I think this is applicable everywhere across the board in business. Um, this is a critical piece. Yeah, no, I, I love that story that you shared there. And I think it's so important. Um, and it's jogging a few ideas in my own mind of like things that we should be focused on in our own brand. Because this entire year, we've been so focused on like, driving KPIs, establishing a scorecard for the business, where are we at quantitatively all the time. But what we're not doing a great job of is kind of like what you talked about is like, we do have like our customer service monthly report, but like 
we're not building that into like, we're not tweaking our copy or anything like that based off of what we're learning. Um, so if you could go back in time, Simone, like what was it that the customers were saying that you should have done if you could go back in time? Like what would you have done? What were people saying and how could you have changed the narrative? Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, well, one thing people were really liking a different, uh, like shine on the cocktail shaker. And, uh, this is not like, not like we were getting bad reviews, but hidden in good reviews were, uh, and not just our reviews. Like we also look at, I mean, especially now we look at reviews of our competitors, but hidden in a lot of the good reviews was this concept of like just the different shine on the shaker, right? Like ours is not that it's not shiny, but I would consider it maybe a little bit more matte than polished. And the look that people like right now is just polished. Yeah. Right. And that's like a very easy change. You just be like, Hey, it's wire. Like, let me just change it from this look to a little bit more shiny. Right? They can do that very easily. That, well, I, I know now they could do it very easily, but it's just not something that we're like, you know, we're doing so well uh, from conversion rate. How can we go from, 20% to 22%, right? Like that's a huge, like that 22, that 2% 2 yep. increase in conversion rate is X amount of increase in revenue, right? Like, great. Um, uh, so that, that actually was a really big one. The second thing is um, people were really liking the aesthetic of their stand. Um, and we had some stands, but we didn't, you know, when, when we ran some tests, it was never the first thing that people pointed to when we did stuff online. Mm. We've gone back and we try to do different things with this product now, but the interesting thing is when we did stuff um, in person, people would pick up the stand and they would play with the stand a lot longer and, and their eyes were drawn to this stand. And so while, you know, we ran, you know, a whole bunch of pick foods and we've been running pick foods forever, right? We used to do yeah. pick foods on different products. We'd run five second tests on a whole bunch of different products way back in the day, like landing pages, home pages, different things, you know, our different businesses. And so these are things that we brought into e-commerce too. When we did that, people weren't saying that, right? People would say like, oh, like I, I like the shininess or, oh, like this just looks more premium. And so we, we were focused very much on, on like the cocktail shaker and the tools and, and those things because people, like the concept of a stand never came up that much. However, when we got people in person, you could see their eyes like really drawn to the stand, uh. right? And no matter if it's the, the thing was together or we laid out all the tools and the stand was on the side, People inevitably, inevitably came back to the stand, but no one verbally talked about it, right? And so I think, you know, going back in time, we would do a lot of these things that we were talking about now, right? Getting people in front of you, right? Doing much more customer, we call it customer development. Um, and really finding that, like, right product market fit. We would do that because we just, we didn't and it shows. Um, I think the last thing is, if we can go back, you know, uh, from a like, and this is this, I guess, maybe like falls back into a um, uh, more quantitative a bit, but I think it's kind of a, a nice, you know, how this is actually, you know, they're not two different things, right? I think the yeah. way it should be working is you're using both in harmony with each other, and one should feed the other, which should feed the other, and you have this like really nice positive flywheel, ideally positive flywheel. Um, but uh, from a from a like iteration perspective, um, I think it's important that you know when you're doing testing, and I, I wish we would had done this like, from the very beginning. Is when we do some of the pick food testing, it's very easy to just stand back and look at, okay, like this one, this image one. Let's throw up this image, right? Yep. Um, and then, you know, go on to the next test and say, oh, this one, one, let's do this one. Or, you know, you, you, you throw up a, some bullets and you're like, oh, wow, like rank over this period of time is dramatically better than that. But when you do some of that, that testing, there's a whole qualitative component, like even on PicFu, right? Like the bottom is all the written responses. Yeah. But right? there's, there's all this interesting feedback that if you go through and understand why this one won, well, then it may be winning for reasons that you didn't expect. And that's kind of what was happening for us. Right. We 
consistently would test out like hero image and, and ours would win. But yet, you know, our click through rate never really got, I mean, it got better, but it never really like got that much better. And ultimately they improved upon us because there was this underlying, you know, uh, qualitative component to it where people were starting to say, or through like, uh, you know, you kind of have to parse through that they yep. actually like the shiny bit more or they like certain tools or they really like the stand. But that we thought that, you know, oh, like we add some flair, like we make a non TOS compliant hero image and, yeah. you know, we'll have it up for as long as Amazon lets us. And, and that wins pick foo, so it's going to win here. But that, those weren't the reasons why it was winning. Right. Mm. And over time, we started to not win anymore because those things that people were saying underneath it, you know, ultimately went out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think those are those are great takeaways. And Simone, I know we we talked about this prior to the interview, but you had a great kind of takeaway from Billion Dollar Seller Summit, right? And it was just kind of like getting back to the basics. Is this the brand that you're kind of referring to or is that kind of a separate story in and of itself? Yeah, same brand, same brand. So, um you know, the beginning of this year was it's a little bit painful for us for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, I think a lot of e-commerce sellers are going through it. It's just industry trends were tough, right? Like rates going crazy. Um, we're still reeling from that. Um, and a number of other reasons, but, <clears throat> um, so basically for a few months prior to BDSS, we had a hero product, um, on the coffeeware side of this brand. And, uh, so we talk about, uh, you know, there's three, historically speaking, there was three products that make up, you know, let's call it like 75% of this brand's profit. Um, and so one was the shaker that we were talking, shaker set that we were talking about. Um, and then another one was this, uh, coffeeware AirPod. Um, so, you know, if you ever go into like a hotel conference room, right, this thing that holds like three liters of coffee is a pour yep. spout. So we sell those and um, what we started seeing, let's call it from the spring uh, was we started seeing rank bleed. Hmm. Not sure why. So, you know, what used to be a bestseller all of a sudden now no longer has bestseller badge. Now it's the middle of the page. Now it's kind of teetering off, falling off the first page, even for like a few days fell off the first page. And we were doing a lot of different things. Like pulling again, like trying a whole bunch of different hacks, trying, you know, a whole bunch of different, let's call them intermediate to advanced level stuff. Yeah. Um, and things kind of work for a little bit. Um, we even were doing a bunch of external ads and that was, that was working for, for a little bit. And the, the amount it was working was just a little bit, right? Like we were doing it for a while. Uh, and we're like, oh man, what is going on? We tried what we felt was like everything under the sun, went to the conference. Yep. And the conference was a really nice kind of reset for me. It was really nice. Okay. You know, one of the speakers, Anthony from Data Dive, I thought he did a phenomenal job. And and my biggest takeaway from what he was talking about was like, hey, let's get back to basics, right? Let's get back to the things that, you know, if you can master the fundamentals, well, then you can start to build again. And so it was a, a, a question of, you know what? we are simply not executing well enough. And, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of product you have. doesn't matter how good your star rating is or the reviews you have. If you don't execute, right? Uh, same thing in anything, right? Sports, whatever. If you don't execute, if you don't execute well, well, you're going to have suboptimal results. And yep. I felt like that's what was happening. We simply were not doing the basics well enough. And so came back told the team, okay, we're going to execute better, right? Like we are going to get back to square one. We're going to get back to listing optimization. We're going to get back to um, looking at what people are saying. Where, where can we improve our product? We are going to improve our images, but use it, but use these tools that we've kind of fallen away from, right? And and because it used to be a bestseller badge, we kind of stopped touching it because this concept yeah. of like, oh, well, it's, we don't want to touch it's it. Working. It's like the bestseller, yep. right? Yep. Yeah, yep. don't want to touch it, right? Yep. Terrible idea, by the way, right? Lesson learned, right? Terrible idea. Like, it doesn't matter if you have the bestseller badge or you don't. Like, you should be iterating on your product. You should be listening to your customers. You should be, Good you know, pick, you should be pick-fooing, right? 
you should like if you have 25 percent conversion rate if you have 30 percent conversion rate you can always get better conversion rate you should like if you still have the same amount of traffic but you have better conversion rate you have more sales right it's that simple right yeah. You can, your job should always be trying to get better conversion rate, right? And you do that by, you know, listening to your customers, like consistently pick for link, seeing what people have to say, why people like certain things better than others, and, and then incorporating that into the next round of iteration. I think Anthony, mm-hmm. again, did a great job of really highlighting that, and he had his own ways of doing it, which I loved. Um, but anyway, so our, our AirPod, it lost a ton of rank, came back, and one of the first things we noticed was like, oh, my God. Uh, some keywords have changed. The the search volume has changed, and Amazon is doing different things in terms of weighting where the placement of certain keywords and how much emphasis they placed on that. It seemed like it changed, and so we all we did <laughs> was we took a keyword that was uh, not in our title, we added it in the title, and it brought it from the bottom of the first page basically up to the you know top four results on that page for that main keyword right really and so the story doesn't end there there's there was it was a paranasin right there's okay. there's uh two two child variations okay so we're like you know what okay we're back right let's break apart this so that we can capture more market share on the page yep broke it apart the hero fell back again Almost like within a few days, mm. it was crazy, right? Drop was precipitous. Like, what, 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 what just happened? Interesting. Again, did the same thing. Got back to the basis. We're looking at the was looking at the um, listing. Noticed that in the bullets, uh, you know, comparatively, right? We're just looking at our competitors, but also comparatively, the two child asins. Asins. We were looking at the placement of certain um, keywords on our key keywords in the bullets and also in the uh, search terms. We played around with that. Used help by uh, from Data Dive to do a lot of this stuff. So shout out to those guys. Their product I think is phenomenal. Yeah. And um, and then shortly after that, ranks start improving, again, improving, again, improving, again. And um, last I checked, I think it was the end of last week, we had the best seller badge. We started playing around with some price. Um, I heard we just lost it, but we're gonna drop price a little bit. And maybe I think we got a little greedy, but I think you know I'm gonna get it back again here. But long story short, in two months, right since um. Uh, the end of the conference until, um, you know, two months later, you know, now it's a little bit more than two months. Uh, it went from, you know, X in terms of profit. We doubled that. Um, and this was already a, um, like a five figure gross profit product. Amazing. And we doubled that, uh, just by these few text changes. um, and so, right, like I think we talk about some advanced strategies going from seven to eight figures. Right? This alone kind of did that for us, this yeah. one product and this one change. Um, so I think you're never too big to get away from the basics, right? Like, and I think sometimes just going back to what they are is important. Because, you know, Amazon's changing all the time. Environment's changing all the time. Um, and so now we're we're doing a couple of different things surrounding those things and surrounding our variations because I think that's um, we talk about brand building and what people are liking and looking for and satisfying what people are saying. Um, but yeah, that, that root change right there, I think was um, kind of brand changing actually. So fascinating. You know, I think this, this is probably a good note to kind of start wrapping things up on here. So when you refer to like just getting back to the basics and you've been able to make some big shifts and double some sales on a super high, um, high volume product. Um, what are those basics? Can you lay out those basics in kind of order of importance that you are now focusing on with your other brands? You have, you have established brands, you're doing well. What you're saying is like, it's not some ninja hack or black hat tactic that I'm doing. That's driving all these crazy results. You're like, Hey, we haven't touched our uh, title in X number of years and we made one change and we shot from the bottom of page one to the top. Um, so can you articulate to us what are those basic things that people should be focused on that many of us have probably neglected if you have a product that you haven't touched in a few years? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I would say the, the the top things and I think there's some debate on on you know, which order you can do them. I think you can kind of somewhat do them simultaneously, but I think your images, 
right? And then your title and bullets, um, title then bullets, um, are uh, the most. I mean, let's say the image carousel, right? Are are hands down the most important. Um, and then and then you get into like A plus content, and then description from there. You know, brand story, um, and then like back end keywords. I think they're kind of being phased out in some cases, but for us, they yeah. actually made a big impact still. So uh, it's not being phased out everywhere yet, right? Um, or if it is being phased out, it's kind of rolling. So, you know, some, some places it still works. Uh, but I think that's kind of the order that I would take things because it seems like that's the order that Amazon is also taking them. Um, and so this is all under a bucket of what I call, you know, just basic listing optimization, right? Which yep. is at the end of the day, conversion rate optimization, yep. which at the end of the day, what you're talking about, right? You know, going back to kind of like, market and what is it, your true thing, right? If if you're not going to increase the search volume, right? Search volume is the same. And, you know, let's say you're going to get roughly the same amount of clicks onto your page, but you have, you know, 10% conversion rate and that's you know, actually X amount of sales. The only way to increase this number of sales there, because if you're not going to have more clicks, right? You, you have to increase the conversion on your page. And so right. I think that's where everything starts, right? And if you, if you can nail that, well, then you could do a lot of other things, right? Because then you know people are going to convert at a decent level. So you're going to be paying a lot of money potentially, but at least you're going to get some of that conversion back. Um, and so I think everything starts there. And that's when you say back to basics, at least at Vimbley Group, we talk about, all right, let's 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 focus on the list, listing optimization. Let's focus on the copy, the keyword research. You know, and those, with those the, few elements that really matter. Yeah, and with the images, you listed those as like number one. Are there any quick tips that you would share about images that you would say that based on your tests have proven to be successful that like some quick takeaways? Yeah, so I think PicFu is really good, right? PicFu style, there's a whole bunch of different services out there that do that. Um, But I think a lot of people forget about the qualitative stuff, right? Understand why certain ones are winning, not just see the numbers, right? Um, Number two is five second test. You know, Anthony was, did a great job touting this, um, which was a good reminder for us that we got to do more of it. Um, but making sure that people just flat out understand what they are looking at, <laughs> I think it's kind of yeah. like a very basic thing, but you know, I think sometimes we, we forget that when we're looking at something all the time, that someone who's looking at something for five seconds may not see it the same way. And um, I don't care how complex your product is, there is going to be a way that you can portray that in a manner in which someone who's quickly going through it can understand it. You're just not, you just need to do the work to find it. It may be harder, may take more time, right? If you have a more complex product, but you can do it. Right. And I think understand, you get a lot of garbage responses on some of these things, but there's a lot of good ones too. And it's just about, you know, running it enough to, to, kind of tease out some of those and to paint a nice mosaic about what's actually happening with your images, right? What people are understanding, what are the takeaways that they're getting from what it is that you've created? I love it. I think those are some great takeaways and thanks for sharing your experience with us, Simone. As we wrap thing, as we wrap things up here, I've got my three final questions that I will ask you. But before we get into that, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. So here are the three takeaways that I noted, Simone. Let me know if you think I'm missing something. So number one, I'm going back to my notes here. So as we go back, three takeaways that people can implement is identifying the market opportunity for your products. Are you playing in a big market or are you playing in a small market? Um, And you used a good reference where, you know, the amount of effort and time that it takes to create the listing images, the title, the copy, and all of that for a product that is in a small market is actually the same amount of time that it's going to take to launch a product in a bigger market. Now, with capital being aside, right, um, those, as you look at your return on investment, you need to start seeing like, if I launch this product, what products am I saying no to? Or if I'm acquiring this brand, What other brands am I saying no to? And I think you can use that kind of like big versus small uh, market opportunity. It no matter what business you're in, whether you're looking at products, acquiring businesses, or you're looking at new opportunities 
um, for yourself. So that's takeaway number one is, is identifying that. Um, number two is actually listening to your customers. And so we, we talked so much about the KPIs, understanding conversion rate, click through rate, impressions, all of that stuff is good. But at the end of the day, get back to the basics of like, do you understand what your customers are saying? When was the last time that you actually looked and, and fielded some customer service emails? Um, we just had our VP of operations for our business cover customer service for three days. And although, that. you know, you could, you could say, Hey, like this guy's pay grade is, is much higher than, you know, doing regular customer service cut and paste, um, you know, remarks. He now understands our brand, some of the pain points that customers are having better than he did before. And so uh, w I do it at least once a year. I cover customer service. So does my wife. So we can get a, a little flavor of like, wait, what are people actually saying? Um, so that's that's a quick takeaway. And then last final takeaway is get back to the basics and keep testing, keep iterating because that conversion rate is one of the most important things. Whether you're selling on Shopify or on Amazon, don't just set it and forget it. Again, there's a lot of the gurus that preached, oh, Amazon, make all this passive income. Like, that's not what e-commerce is about. It is not passive income. You have to be regularly testing. Or like you kind of shared in your story there, Simone, like somebody else is going to start to chip away at that market share. And you're going to look back a couple of years later and be like, oh, crap, where did it all go? We've seen that happen in our own business as well. And so uh, this is me talking to myself at the exact same time. So those are, I think, three real actionable takeaways that everybody can apply to their business. Simone, is there anything else that comes to your mind that we didn't cover? I, I think I think you got it all. Uh, I could see that you must have done really well in school. You, you, you listened intently the entire time. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I've been jotting down notes because you were sharing a, a lot of great value. Um, Simone, as we wrap things up here, what has been your most influential book that you've read and why? Um, so I think I'm going to go a little bit off the map on this one. I think most of the time, probably people come on these type of podcasts and, and say stuff related to e-commerce or business in general. I got a ton of those are because people use that often. I'm going to go with something a little different. Um, the book is called um, uh, The Power of Dreams, Why We Sleep and Why It Matters. It's by uh, Matthew Walker. Um, the analogy that I like to give is effectively, look, if you're not optimizing your sleep, it's kind of like you're stepping over dollar bills to pick up nickels, mm. right? Like everything stems from getting the requisite amount of sleep. And I think people take it for granted. I think we live in a society in the U S here where, right. It's like kind of like, you know, working these 80 hour, 90 hour, hundred hour weeks, getting almost no sleep, uh, like is often promoted. But I think if you took a step back and you did an experiment on yourself and, uh, you know, I got this aura ring to prove it and, and, you know, productivity, um, you know, accomplishments to prove it where if you took a step back, you got a requisite amount of sleep for you. Um, the amount of clarity that you have when you're working and the amount of creativity that you can add to that clarity is incredible. And so I think there's almost nothing more important than sleep. And uh, this book kind of dives into the importance of it. Um, and, uh, to be perfectly frank, I was scared. It scared the crap out of me because of the negative ramifications of not getting enough sleep, which, you know, comes from the best banking world. Uh, I lived. For a yeah, long time. sure. So, uh, yeah, that's, that is the book. great feedback. That's one I'm going to have to check out. And I would probably, that's probably going to lead into the next thing. What's your favorite productivity tool or resource? <laughs> well, so, uh, I got two for you. One is this aura ring. Okay. Uh, lately, um, also as a quick you know call back to we talked about customer support, right? Like these guys have a phenomenal product. I can't even tell you how great this product is and how much it's impacted not only you know my life on a day to day basis, but also some of my close friends and family. Uh, because like I have not stopped talking about like how great the aura is, how mm. important sleep is, and how they should iterate on it, and like you know read this book and all this stuff. <laughs> um. 
Uh, but their customer support is so bad. And you can go on Facebook and you can see it's littered, including, including posts from me, littered with responses on their posts with people who are irate with their customer support. Uh. Basically, they have this problem where they grew really, really fast and they claim that they didn't get the customers. They didn't have enough help and they couldn't hire people fast enough to handle all the customer support. Interesting. So take that for what it is. But it's made me, right, like less thrilled about the brand, like not want to upgrade. Like I, this was like the third ring I have and I like upgraded a couple times. I almost don't want to. And I still love the product itself, but I almost because I don't like the brand anymore because of this terrible customer support experience, I almost don't want to level up. Right. I don't want to get the next product that they come out with or the next version. Interesting. Even though I'm now like a lifetime user of this thing um, because of their customer support. Interesting. So so that that's one. And a quick for the second one, I think for a productivity standpoint, I really like Workflowy. Um, It's really light. Easy to use. Um, it's kind of like a bullet system where, or a Google Doc system, but then you can uh, like zoom into or zoom out of bullets. And That's so cool. it's like a single doc that you can have access to on your phone, or your laptop, kind of wherever, right? There's both a mobile app and a desktop app. And, um, and you can just set up, you know, your few main bullets and then zoom into each one and continuously zoom in, you know, zoom out, what have you. Um, but it's, it's effectively kind of starts out on one doc. So it's a nice little like light thing where um, I do a lot of my planning. I do personal stuff. I have some work stuff um, and uh, it's really easy and lightweight. And I think for me, simple tools always end up being the best because then they're easy to use. They're quick to use. You can have access to them anywhere. Um, and uh, it's kind of, you know, not a lot of bells and whistles. It's kind of a, a big thing for me kind of yeah decluttering so work flowly correct work flowy work flowy all right yep work flowy all right very good i'll check that one out too all right last question who's somebody that you admire the most or respect the most in the e-commerce space that other people should be paying attention to yeah um so uh I actually really like, so I don't know him that well. Like we met him, I met him, you know, I had a chance to talk to him a couple of times at BDSS, but I think Kevin King is, uh, I'm really impressed with, <clears throat> uh, his ability to grapple with some of the new things out there. And I really like the new thing that he's working on where he's basically, um, he's, promoting something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, uh, kind of this eco-friendly nature. He's got this new um, kind of plastic technology that kind of disintegrates in water, which I think is yeah. mind-blowing to me. Um, but uh, he's incorporating a lot of things that is going beyond just traditional e-commerce selling, and that's really incorporating a lot of stuff that, you know, from our roots, I think is really cool. Um, or from my roots, right? At Vimley Group is really cool, where he's incorporating a lot of new technologies into selling product, um, and he's selling product that is meaningful to the world, right? It's meaningful to people. He's making, he's trying to make a difference, and I think you know that's kind of everything that we're talking about here, right? Like you know, you look at big market opportunity, you look at listening to what people are saying, right? Where is this like wave of people, what they're looking for, and you know, people want to make a difference in what's happening. Um, and in the environment, right? Um, and, uh, he's kind of bringing it back to the basics and selling, but he's taking all these advanced technologies and he's bringing it back to, to doing that. And I think that's pretty cool. So, yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm a him. follower of Kevin King and the billion dollar seller summit that he put together. That's where you and I met. We've had Kevin King totally. on the podcast before. So go back. It's one of our first few episodes, uh, for people to go back and he, he dropped a lot of great knowledge there. Um, Simone, this has been a pleasure. Where can people reach out to you if they have more questions, want to follow you and get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Simone Hammer. And uh, it's spelled like Simon. I have to always say that because I always get some some people who say, oh, hey, I can't find you. And I'm like, drop the E. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, or, uh, and, you know, in this day and age, it's kind of a shocker, but I tend to, I guess I have, I'm on social media, but don't find me there because I'm never, I don't go on and try to make it a point not to go on. 
Um, or you can email me at Simone at Vimbley And, uh, you know, I'll usually get back to you pretty quick. Awesome. Well, Simone, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully we'll follow up uh, in uh, some future episodes and see how things have been going for you, for you later down the line. But thanks for your time today. Yeah, awesome, Josh. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.